Hi, I'm Shane. And I'm Miranda. Or Chicky. Join us as we explore the largest and northernmost state in the U.S., Alaska. In the third and final episode of our Alaska series, we start off in the largest city of the Alaskan interior, Fairbanks, where we learn firsthand about its gold mining heritage and board a paddle boat cruise to a Native American village to learn more about their regional culture. Arriving in Seward, we explore one of the most stunning parts of the whole state, spotting abundant wildlife and getting up close to epic glaciers within the Kenai Fjords. After taking some time to become familiar with the town itself, including the state's premier aquarium, we venture to a nearby glacier and undertake the most epic hike of our trip to Alaska, making our way up to the most expansive ice field we have ever seen. Due to unforeseen setbacks, we have an extended stay in Anchorage, which gives us the opportunity to explore the largest city of Alaska in more detail including some of the best local trails and, of course, loads of wildlife. Join us in this epic conclusion to our Alaska series. We continue from our previous episode where we spent time exploring the magnificent Denali National Park. All right, Chicky, what's the plan for today? We're heading to Fairbanks. Heading to Fairbanks. <laughs> We've got half the day still here in the National Park. Chicky can't believe we're leaving Denali. She's in Denali. <laughs> <laughs> Knew that was coming. Entering into Fairbanks, our first stop is at one of the biggest oil pipelines in the world. It goes 800 miles south to terminate at the Valdez Marine Terminal, Valdez, Alaska. It was built from 1973 to 1977 and has a diameter of 48 inches. What you see here is not the actual pipeline. They've got installation wrapped around the outside of that pipeline. What you see here is the outer, powerful steel sheeting and casement to protect it all from the weather. Nearby, we learn a crucial part of the history of Fairbanks, gold. Here, we get a hands-on experience learning how it was originally sourced. Back to step one. Shake it at that angle. We do not pan flat. At that same angle, I dip it vertically down and up out of the water. We're taking it to the beach, let the water skim a little bit of sand off the top of that pile. The gold is heavy. It's on the bottom. It's been sitting in that pocket of the pan this whole time. It sinks really quickly. It's the last thing you see. Eventually all the light sands are gonna float off and that heavy, heavy gold remains behind. There's your pay. I call that brand new money. Dredge. So we're at Gold Dredge 8 here in Fairbanks, Alaska. We're about to do some gold panning. All right, you're gonna show us what we need to do. Yeah, so we're gold panning. So we've got this um, little pouch of dirt and apparently, hopefully, some gold in here. Oh, I can already see some speckles. Alright, so shake that out in there. Make sure you get all of it. Go. Now oh, we're gonna want some water in there. Yep. So first. Get some water. I'm gonna give it a little shuffle. And then you just spill it over. There she goes, she got it. Miranda, we're going to weigh the gold now. The competition's <laughs> on. Who's got the most gold? Who do you think? I think you do. <laughs> I did it the impatient way. Okay, so we just got our gold weighed. You had? Eight dollars. Eight US dollars. And mine? Twenty-one. Twenty-one! Winner! <laughs> I was more impatient with it, I think. <laughs> yeah, she'd like finished within a few minutes. It was like, <laughs> how much of that ended up back in the water? Who knows? A but, lot of it, from <laughs> this, my end. <laughs> this is a really cool experience, actually. We learned a lot about the gold mining history of Alaska as well, which started off in the 1890s, pretty much off the tail end of the Yukon gold mining era. And it's kind of funny because the U.S. had only had Alaska for a couple of decades before the gold mining was struck here. And it was kind 
of they bought it off Russia for 7.2 million dollars, which is a steal. I took some time to explore the gold dredge itself, which was used between 1928 and 1959 to dredge the creek for gold. tickets to get a buffet lunch and then we're going on the river boat discovery cruise which our guide said is the number one rated tour to do in alaska so it's pretty exciting we'll see cool there it is there the old paddle snare hey along the way on the Chena River was the Trailbreaker Kennel, founded by the late Susan Butcher, a four-time Iditarod champion, and husband David, where he and their daughters train and breed their amazing huskies. From there, we take a cultural journey to a nearby fishing village where we learn about the native Athabascan culture. the chum are a slightly lesser quality of the other two, we usually like to save that fish to make the food for our dogs. But just because we're doing a demonstration here, I'll just demonstrate the basic dog food cut on the silver salmon here for you all today. I've already cut off the head of the salmon and also cut two fillets kept attached at the tail, cut along the backbone. As you can see, there is still quite a bit of meat left on this backbone. I'll go ahead and cut this off right now and give it to the dogs here at fish camp. And then if this were a head of a higher quality salmon, such as a king, a silver, or a sockeye, then I could use it to make fish head soup, which we would then serve to our elders, and it's considered a delicacy. Down to the skin, creating a larger surface area, allowing the smoke from the smokehouse to work itself deeper into the salmon, further dehydrating and preserving it. Okay, I can see that it almost opens up like a vent to help the smoke get in there. Well, that's beautiful. And now, Noah, you mentioned that you don't put it straight into the smokehouse from here, though. Well, why is that? Well, you never like to place a wet or dripping salmon right to the smokehouse because it might mold. So I'm just going to put it on the outdoor air drying rack, or on it, that is. Then we'll take it into the smokehouse, rotate it around in there for about two weeks until it's fully dehydrated, weighs less than a pound, and looks a little bit like this. Okay, now I'm really impressed you managed to get that whole thing down under a pound, but I, I don't know, Noah. That looks a little bit tough to chew. Uh, I'm sure the dogs are happy with it, but how would you prepare it if it was for you or me to eat? Well, uh, there's actually quite a few things we would do differently for people. First, we'd start out with a higher quality salmon, such as a king of silver or a sockeye, cut and clean them out very well. We like fillets as demonstrated, but they can also be cut into small vertical pieces called salmon strips. Either way, they'll be soaked in a brine of brown sugar, honey, salt, and then placed on the outdoor air drying rack and then taken into the smokehouse for probably just about three or four days since we like a softer texture. And then finally, the wood that we use is different. We'll use alder wood or cottonwood since they're sweeter woods, but for the dogs, spruce wood or driftwood, they're not too picky.
So as a part of the steamboat tour, we stop off here at the China Athabascan village. So it's kind of like a replica village of the native Athabascan people. It sort of goes through the different eras of Athabascan life, so pre-European contact and then post-European contact, as well as uh, they sort of go through some of the different uh, parts of their culture, like the types of clothes and how they would treat uh, furs and skins and things like that to create clothing. So. So behind me there we have the reindeer, also known as caribou, or at least domesticated caribou, and you can see the velvet on their antlers. So this time of the year the velvet actually pumps blood around the antlers and helps them grow. And the caribou were very important to the native Athabascan people because it was basically the main source for meat and one of the main sources for fur and materials to use creating their temporary accommodations that they were able to pack up and leave throughout the different seasons. So they were nomadic migratory people. Around up here, you can see some examples of Alaska's largest game animals. Over to your far right, you can see the hide of a grizzly bear. In the middle, we have the moose, and closest to me, we have the hide of a caribou. And if you look right over here to your left, you will see a full-size example of a bull moose. See, what a skilled hunter. <laughs> and because bull moose are very territorial, that noise might just bring one into the area to investigate the intruder he was on his turf. But another way they would call the bull moose was verbally using a birch bark megaphone like this. The hunter would imitate the bull moose mating call, which is a deep, guttural, grunting sound. Would you all like a demonstration? <laughs> <laughs> So what you see behind us are sort of examples of what the Athabascans would have lived in after the European contact, so more of the permanent log-style cabins there. So the roofs as well, they had sort of mosses and uh, soil and also grass on top, not only to help insulate but also as well they keep them wet and sodden and it uh, prevents from fire damage too. So practical purposes right there and that was after they were able to start farming and live a bit more of a, a settled lifestyle as opposed to the traditional nomadic style that we saw before.
got in there, Miranda? So we've got king crab, which is that massive claw that you see there, Alaskan king crab. Yep. We've got snow crab. We've got dungeness crab. We've got garlic bread, mussels, reindeer, sausage, <laughs> corn, shrimp. Miranda's going to eat all the reindeer sausage, aren't yeah, you, Miranda? That's all you can eat, but I will eat the crab. And where are we? What's the name of the place? Kite's Landing. There you go. This is called the Hammer Time. In Fairbanks, Alaska. All right. Hammer Time, Chicky. Let's so do it. Excited. Welcome to our cute little hostel room here in Seward, Seward. at the Moby Dick Hostel. We woke up early, head to the airport. We flew from Fairbanks to Anchorage, which was like a 45 minute flight. It was very short. And then um, from there, we sort of chilled out for a few hours until we caught our bus from Anchorage to Seward. There and we now we're finally here. <laughs> Seward, back on the fjords. So tomorrow we have a fjords tour. We're gonna go check out the Kenai Fjords and learn a little bit more about the area and see some of the similar scenery to what we saw before, but apparently this is the most spectacular area, right, Miranda? Yes, yeah. it's, it's up there. She knows all about it. So yeah, we're gonna do that and uh, we'll have to keep an eye on the weather. The forecast is not so great, but uh, if it does clear up at any stage, there's some great hikes that have been recommended to us by Brett, our guide um, for the first half of our land portion here in Alaska. And I wouldn't mind doing some kayaking, but we, it all really depends on the weather at this stage. So we aren't 100% sure what we're going to do out here on the Kenai Peninsula, but whatever it's going to be, it's going to be awesome. Yeah. So a bit of a rainy morning this morning, but we are heading to our bus to get to our activity today. We're going on a 7.5 hour Kenai Fjords tour throughout the Kenai Fjords. Hopefully we'll be spotting a lot of wildlife. So yeah, it should be fun. It's one of the main things to do here. So And enjoy the sunshine, of course. <laughs> what sunshine? <laughs> An absolute highlight in Alaska. The Kenai Fjords are the reason we travel to Seward. The park is named after the many fjords carved by glaciers moving down the mountains from the Harding Ice Field. Fjords are glacial valleys that have been submerged below sea level by a combination of land subsidence and rising sea levels. The coastal rainforest, pristine glacial waters, and steep fjords create a diverse ecosystem home to many different kinds of wildlife. The coastal rainforest provides habitat for bears, moose, and wolves, whereas the pristine glacial waters are home to whales, sea otters, and seals which you can see resting on the sea ice. The rocky outcrops provide the perfect habitat for the stellar sea lions, whereas the cliffs make the perfect nesting grounds for puffins, cormorants and bald eagles. Also mountain goats are very happy navigating the ledges of the cliffs. It is estimated that 3,600 to 4,600 mountain goats occupy the Kenai Peninsula. Mountain goats are not true goats at all, but belong to the antelope family. The hoofs of mountain goats consist of two toes that can move independently from each other, allowing for its stunning agility on steep terrain. From the boat, we could see puffins swooping from rocky islets. Kenai Fjords National Park is home to two different species of puffins, the horn puffin and the tufted puffin. Puffins are pelagic seabirds which feed primarily by diving in the water. They breed in large colonies on coastal cliffs or offshore islands, nesting in crevices among rocks or in burrows in the soil.
spotting seals on rocks and sea otters in the water among melting breakaway ice that leads the way, we approached our first large glacier. Glacier in Aalik Bay, and there's also another little one around the corner here called Surprise Glacier. The Holgate Glacier is a tidewater glacier that flows from the Harding Ice Field out towards the Holgate Arm in Aaliak Bay. The glacier is three miles or five kilometers long and approximately half a mile or 800 meters wide. Gate Glacier, we head further within Aliak Bay to the Great Aliak Glacier. The glacier ice appears blue due to the red long wavelength of the sunlight being absorbed by ice, whereas the blue short wavelength is being transmitted and scattered. Behind we have the Aelic Glacier, which is, I believe they said three miles across, so making it much larger than the Holgate one we saw before. Uh, behind us you can also see a whole bunch of seals sitting there, and they sit on the ice because they actually hide from the orca. Uh, the orca can't use their echolocation underwater when they have the, the sound of the ice cracking and breaking and falling off into the water, so it sort of provides protection. There's tons of sea otters around here too, so it's a really, really beautiful spot. One of the best places to view harbour seals in the National Park is at Aaliak Glacier. Here you can often see them resting on glacial ice. They use this ice as a means to rest, reproduce and raise their pups in safety. There are also other uses for the ice such as a fishing platform or using the ice as mentioned before as a means to escape and hide from predators. Below deck, they were breaking up freshly carved glacial ice for cocktails. You guys are in, interested in a six dollar glacial margarita, or if there's any sober sailors on board, we do have a three dollar virgin margarita option. Departing the bay, we were farewelled by humpback whales that frequent the nutrient-rich waters of the area in the summertime from their winter breeding grounds in Hawaii. Hmm. 
Once again, high above, we spot mountain goats daringly clinging onto steep cliffs to find the only accessible grasses in the sheer dynamic landscape. Heading towards open waters, we find a large stellar sea lion colony set on high rocks where large male bull seals strive for dominance over their significant broods. Stellar sea lions are the largest members of the otarid or eared seals family, with males reaching over 1,000 kilograms or 2,400 pounds. Sea Life Center is actually the premier aquarium in all of Alaska and it's the only permanent mammal rehabilitation center in the state as well so they actually do a lot of work in regards to conservation. Some of the money goes towards, actually it's a non-profit so all the money goes towards research and uh, funding towards uh, environmental conservation and also rehabilitation of the animals so it's quite important the work they do here and it's already quite impressive what we've seen so far. Alaska Sea Life Center is the only facility in Alaska that combines a public aquarium with marine research, education, and wildlife response. The center's design includes a public aquarium with exhibit tanks for displaying research animals as well as other North Pacific mammals, birds, fish, and invertebrates. The facility also features a full veterinary suite with quarantine pools for orphaned, diseased, or injured wild animals brought to the center for rehabilitation and for resident animals that need medical treatment. So that was a pretty cool experience, right? Yeah, definitely. Definitely something to do on a rainy day. And now we're walking through downtown Seward, Alaska. All right, on our last full day in Seward, we finally got sunshine Woo. after days of rain and cold. Um, we finally got a great day and it is the perfect day to go hiking. So yeah. we're actually gonna catch the shuttle right now to Isaac Glacier. And we're going to hike one of the most famous and incredible trails in all of Alaska called the Harding Icefield Trail. So, yeah, And we can finally see the mountains, which is amazing too. <laughs> so great day to do it. Yeah. Alrighty, so we are here out on the trail about to reach up to the trail that leads to Exit Glacier. You can see a little sign over here that says 19. 17 and these markers actually indicate where the glacier was during different stages in time we can't even see exit glacier right now and that's how far away it is they've noticed that the recession of ice accelerated since 1894 and has been continuing to accelerate since then so that sort of coincides with the start of the industrial revolution this is one of the smaller glaciers in the Kenai Fjords National Park out of 38 glaciers but it's the most accessible it's the only one that you can reach by car and can walk to so that's why it's such a popular site, so I'm going to check that out shortly. So after about an hour of hiking, we can see the exit glacier. Woo. 
Now we go up there and continue. It's just over a thousand meters of elevation today, so it's a little bit of a tough one. So these pink flowers we see everywhere here is actually the state flower of Alaska. It's known as the fireweed. We actually tried some ice cream the other day with fireweed in it, which is pretty cool. have corrected me she said that these are the state flower the forget-me-not not the fireweed 100 percent sure <laughs> uh, maybe we should check that out afterwards either way it's one of them they're both very common in the state of alaska So apparently these are called salmon berries and bears love them. <laughs> Very sour. So we just saw a little mountain marmot up here, which is pretty cool. No bears yet. We're almost at the cliff tops, so there should be a pretty epic view from up there as well. bad place to have it with these gorgeous views and then we're going to head up to the ridge and have some beautiful views of the Harding Ice Field. So I've spoken a lot about glaciers in some of the previous episodes. I might explain what type of glacier we have here. This is called a valley glacier. So a valley glacier sort of sits in this valley that it carves through and, and it actually creates a valley. Now what we see up in the hills up here, these are known as hanging glaciers. It's essentially what a valley glacier would be once it's retreated. So by the time this retreats back to here, which probably won't be too long at the rate that it's going, it will become somewhat like a hanging glacier. But this is being fed down by the Harding Ice Field. So we're going to go up to the ice field and we'll talk a little bit more about the ice field up there. we found ourselves in a rocky environment, perfect habitat for a female rock ptarmigan and her chicks. You can see this landscape up here has been pushed and shoved around by glacial movement. So this put it, probably would have been part of the exit glacier up until maybe last century. You can see all the gravel pack up on the side there. This is all the glacial moraine on the side. So 
So we've reached the top. That below us down there is the Harding Ice Field. 700 square miles at 1,126 square kilometers, which is roughly three times the size of New York City. Now the weight of all that ice and snow there compacts down to feed all 38 glaciers in the Kenai Fjords National Park, including the Exit Glacier that we've just climbed up beside. Pretty spectacular. I don't think I've ever seen a larger ice field in my life. In fact, can't even see the end. <laughs> so that's by far, I think, the largest ice field I've ever seen. What do you think, Miranda? Oh, it's absolutely spectacular. <laughs> I've never seen anything like it either. <laughs> this has just been phenomenal, this hike so far. All the wildlife, the wildflowers, and it feels like we're walking in the clouds right now. <laughs> it's yeah. cool. Was that tricky? Oh, that was amazing. <laughs> it truly does earn its reputation as one of the best, if not the best, day hikes in Alaska. I can't say for certain because I haven't done them all, but uh, I can't imagine getting much better than this in a, in a day. It's absolutely stunning. So, making our way back down now. Um, should take us a couple of hours to get down. If we see anything exciting on the way, we'll show you. friend again on our way down. This time he was joined by a friend. Related to woodchucks and groundhogs, marmots are one of the largest members of the squirrel family. Mating season begins once the snow melts in April and early May and pups emerge in late June or July. As we have witnessed, marmots are affectionate creatures. They can be found grooming each other and rubbing noses together as signs of affection. During mating season, the males have been known to even bring dried flowers to their potential mates. So they actually call this Marmot Meadows, and this is our third Marmot of the trip. Right there. Hey, buddy. Throughout the hike, I began to feel run down and unwell, something I shrugged off at the time as the weariness and fatigue of active travel over a few months. Some downtime in Anchorage sounded like the perfect recovery. We're at Fire Island Bakery getting the best bread that we've had in all of the USA. Mm -hmm. It's awesome. Alrighty. Last day in Alaska. We're here in Anchorage and uh, we're just going to do a little bit of a walk around. Uh, there's really not that much to do today because it is kind of wet. We might do a little bit of sightseeing but later on today we are flying out, or this evening I should say, we are flying out to Los Angeles and we should arrive tomorrow morning. Yeah. Big day. We did stop at a place before, it was the Fire Island Bakery. And honestly, we went there yesterday for lunch and decided to go back again today because the food is so damn good. We've had a bit of a problem in the States trying to find good bread because most of the bread is very sugary, but this is like proper good stuff. And one of the popular things to have in Alaska is the sourdough because the sourdough was basically the name that they gave to all the old miners in the early days in the 1800s. They got the reputation of being the sourdough and plus they were sour for being here and generally didn't have enough dough to leave. So that's kind of how the story goes a little bit. Surprise! We're still in Alaska. We're actually still in Anchorage. Uh, we were prepared to leave and then Miranda started feeling sick and uh, tested positive for COVID. In fact, we both tested positive for COVID. So we've been isolating here in Anchorage for the last three days. Not really much to report on there. We've been hanging out in this little Airbnb that we got, which is Kind of nice. It's yeah. cool. It's starting to get a little stir crazy to be honest. So we're going to go outside to get some fresh air, go for a walk. Obviously, we're going to manage some social distance. We're looking forward to getting some fresh air and we've got another two days in isolation before we actually head to LA, which was our original plan. We kind of had to change everything, which was all sorted through our insurance to recover more. So that was yeah. kind of good of them to sort everything out for us. We're doing the Chester Creek Trail, I should mention. So this is just over seven miles. It should take us around about two hours, give or take, to get down and back. So we're looking for moose. 
for moose hunting with cameras, not guns, but uh, <laughs> hopefully we find one. If it seems we are being very cautious with COVID regulations, remember this was summer 2022. We were following the laws of this time period. With minimal symptoms, fresh air, and social distance, we felt this was a responsible compromise. So it's kind of weird, but we keep going past all these tents, and according to the map, there is no campground inside the forest here, so I'm not sure exactly what's going on with all the tents. Whether it's homeless people, or if it's some sort of village or something like that, um, no idea. So if anyone knows, let us know. With approximately 300 moose in the Greater Anchorage area, it was only a matter of time before we ran into our first. How's that, Chicky? Success. Success of what? We saw a moose. We saw a moose. What happened? It was just munching on some leaves. That was exciting. Yeah. We're walking past and I just sort of saw the shape at the corner of my eye, my peripheral. I just looked straight over. Saw it there in the, I don't know uh, how the woods. I saw it. It was like... <laughs> they camouflaged. Way in the Blended. woods. But yeah, no, that was pretty cool. Yeah, so we saw our moose. Female, we still yet to see male moose. We've seen a lot of females so far. I just want to see some of those big antlers, just not up close. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> cool. Alright, here we are. We made it to our final destination, which is Goose Lake Park. Halfway, because <laughs> we do have to return. What do you think, Miranda? Alright? Yeah, it was a beautiful walk. Yeah, it's a nice little walk, you know, and not the most spectacular walk in the world, but for the middle of Anchorage, it's pretty awesome. And we saw a moose yeah. as well. It's pretty amazing that you could see a creature that large, you know, much larger than a horse, a wild creature in the middle of a city. <laughs> it's just bizarre. Looks like our moose has crossed over to the other side of the road. This is just in plain sight. We're trying to keep a little bit of a distance. You can already see a lot of the leaves here starting to change colour and that's literally because they only get about six weeks of summer or five weeks of summer. So autumn is pretty much just about to start or starting. Alrighty, so one of the top things to do in Anchorage is the Tony Knowles Trail, which is essentially a coastal trail that goes down to Kincaid Park from the center of Anchorage, which is just south of the airport. So it's a 21 mile journey, roughly about 33 and a half kilometers. And we've got about two hours before the weather kicks in and that rain starts to hit. So we thought, what is the quickest and best way to experience the trail? We've got ourselves some e-bikes. Oh yeah, extra fast. <laughs> extra fast. This is from Pablo's Bike <laughs> Rentals in Anchorage. And these are really fast. They go up to 25 miles per hour. We're gonna be cruising along the Cook Inlet right here. And that name might sound familiar for those of 
of you that watched our Australia series, because Cook was the first British man to explore the east coast of Australia back in 1770 on his first voyage of discovery. Well, he came back out this way or up this way in 1776 on his third voyage of discovery and opened up and explored a lot of this area through here. Ended up dying on that voyage of discovery actually in Hawaii. So it's one of the last places he explored and the Cook Inlet's named after him. But one of the things we're really excited about seeing and they see a lot of are more moose. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to explore this trail and check it out, see what we see. Oh, this really has some speed on it. With our five days in quarantine finished and COVID symptoms gone, we were ready for one last adventure in Alaska. So we're here at the Earthquake Park, which is a memorial to a massive earthquake that occurred on the 27th of March, 1964, 9.2 on the Richter scale, which is absolutely insane. The reason why we have so many earthquakes in this area and such a seismically active area is because just off the coast here is the tectonic rift between the Pacific Plate and the North American Plate, where the Pacific Plate is actually being subducted beneath the North American Plate. On the lookout also for bears, it wasn't long before we spotted our first moose. The difference this time is that we stumbled upon a mother and two calves. Since moose are solitary animals, the only time you'll see a group of moose together is a mother moose with her calves. A mother moose sticks with her calves to protect them against predators and to teach them how to forage and survive. Most moose mothers are ready to give birth again as soon as one to two years after birthing the previous calves. When this happens, she will chase away her one to two year old calves where they start to survive on their own and live a mainly solitary life. saying that this forest is so beautiful just cruising through here keeping ourselves on alert for moose and also black bears three days ago they actually said that there was someone who got attacked by a black bear in here so the bear's still around somewhere mm. i think on these we could probably outrun it not that you're supposed to do that but we made it to the chalet at kincaid park which is the end of the tony Knowles trail and now we are about to head back and we also saw a moose, female moose there with uh, two calves as well. So it was really, really cool. So I'm going to keep an eye out for them on the way back, make sure we keep our distance. But that was a pretty awesome experience. That was awesome. Do you enjoy the trail? Oh, yeah, it was beautiful. And these bikes are insane. <laughs> they are amazing. They are so cool. We just flew <laughs> up this hill to get up here. Uh, also as well, I kind of feel like the rain and the, the clouds give a little bit of atmosphere. It's kind of nice. The rain has not been bad.
so that was pretty awesome. We were just riding past and we saw another mum and a calf and pulled right over. Unfortunately, there was this really annoying guy that jumped out and sort of walked in front of our shots and it got way too close, closer than you're supposed to get. We are trying to keep at least a little bit of a distance. But anyway, we got to see that. That was pretty awesome. So two mums and uh, three calves in total. So behind me here is the Ted Stevens International Airport, which is where we'll be heading in just a few hours before we fly to Los Angeles. This is actually the third busiest cargo airport in the world after Singapore, and I think the other one's Helsinki, and that's simply because of its strategic position, being here in the, the northern part of North America, essentially all the goods shipped in through Europe go over the North Sea, straight over the North Pole, and fly right in here. And So we've got some beautiful Alaskan weather right now. I'm sure Miranda's appreciating this, recovering from COVID. Hopefully we'll be back shortly. Alaskan king crab, and a grilled cheese, with a seafood chowder and fries. Look at that. Can't stop this woman. She's into it. Our time in Alaska had been as amazing as it was dynamic. From the luxury of cruising the Inside Passage to flying to the top of North America's highest mountain, seeing grizzlies and moose in the wild, hiking to the top of a glacier, and yes, even catching COVID. Adventures are about striving for reward over unpredictable risk. Looking back, we do not have a single regret, and that's how we approach every one of our global travel stories. Thank you for watching this video. If you enjoyed our content, please like and subscribe. And we'd love if you could leave us a comment, letting us know what you've enjoyed or what you'd like to see more of. And help us grow our channel, become part of the Global Travel Stories family by sharing with friends, family or anyone you think would enjoy our content. Thanks guys.